Thank you so much for, for sitting down with us. Uh, we wanted to just sit down with all the statewide candidates and uh, so our viewers could kind of hear from them. And we thought doing this in this kind of way uh, would just kind of give them a different perspective and to kind of hear everything that you'd like to say. Um, so uh, if you could just kind of talk to me about really what motivated you to, you know, run for state superintendent of education here in South Carolina. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you for giving, giving me this opportunity. I look forward to the conversation. I, you know, I've been a teacher for 22 years for the past four years. I've been part of SC for Ed trying to really fight for um, placing a high quality teacher in every classroom and working with the General Assembly and policy and just really realized that we weren't moving in a direction that we needed to. Um, the past couple years, I've watched a lot of my friends and colleagues leave the profession, and it just has really broken my heart to see them leave, but also to see the negative impact on our students. Um, and so when the race came up and I was sort of looking at who was going to run, I really just thought, God, I just need to give it a try and maybe get some, get the teacher voice up at the policy level. And so I asked other people to run who I thought would be good. They all said no. And it just got to the point where I thought, if I don't try, I will always regret um, not taking this next step and fighting for public education. Now, what makes right now uh, such a critical time for education? Wow, um, a lot of stuff. I, you know, we were, are really at a critical moment where education can go one of two ways in South Carolina, and we can continue to fight for it in protecting public education and providing a high quality education for every student in South Carolina, or we can look at the route of dismantling it and, you know, giving the the people who have it a better opportunity and the students who don't have it you know, a, a lower quality education. I'm fighting for a high quality education for every student in South Carolina, and I think that we owe it to our children and we owe it to our state to really provide um, a great education for the students, because they're our future. Over the last, I guess, two years, over two years now, I, you know, I, I, I'll never forget the weekend, uh, or the week um, when everything kind of, you know, changed for everybody. Education changed a lot. How do we kind of come back and recover from all the impacts we've gotten from the pandemic? Well, I think that we have to look at it in several different ways. You know, the focus over the last couple of years has been the, the academic loss. And to me, that is, it, it's not that it's not relevant, but when you look at the fact that we have been in a global pandemic, every student in the world has been in the same situation. So every student has lost academically. And so we've got to start stop treating these students, our, our COVID students, like the students who came prior to them. We've got to just recognize that we are dealing with a different group of students because they all have the shared experience of COVID. And we've got to recalibrate our own ideas of where the students should be because everybody in the entire world is behind academically. Um, what we as teachers have seen that, that was a greater impact on us was the mental and social um, issues that came out of being isolated during COVID. And that's what we have been really trying to address over the last two years is getting students to sort of re-engage with the world. You know, when you think about a lot of school districts, they were virtual for, you know, six, eight, 12 months and then they you know the students came back into a general ed setting and that just really jarred um, our, our students mentally and emotionally and socially they'd sort of forgotten how to interact with others um, and so that's what we really spent last year on was trying to rebuild or reteach or retrain those social aspects that are way more important in the long run than the academics. You know, the academics, you can get to a point where the, the kids are okay, but you've got to be able to get them, you know, to where they're socially able to work in, in the world, right? And so that's what we really need to be looking at moving forward is how we are addressing the social, emotional, and mental health needs of our students, as well as our faculty and staff. You know, one of the things that has sort of been swept under the, the bridge is the loss of life that has happened in COVID. You know, we have students who have lost their, you know, a parent, um, both parents, you know, 
siblings, you know, grandparents, um, and we've had teachers that have lost the, you know, lost loved ones. And so we really haven't, um, I think, acknowledged that loss and how it really just can be detrimental on, you know, the growth of anybody and the well-being. So, you know, I think schools are doing a good job of, of taking care of their own communities and filling those needs, but it's going to take several years for us to get to where we really feel um, like we're in a good place coming out of COVID. Are there certain policies uh, you would maybe like to see the state implement to kind of address this kind of mental health uh, crisis, you could really say, uh, that's kind of impacting our children? Um, I, you know, uh, to me, policies are, are helpful, but only if the funding is there. So if we really want to truly address, you know, mental health in students and social emotional well-being, we have got to properly fund public education. And that has not happened in South Carolina since 2008. We have underfunded, you know, over however many years that is, underfunded. And when you think about where that funding goes, I mean, if you fully funded last year, they underfunded $700 per student. So if you think the funding piece of that, that $700 per student would help bring in your mental health counselors. It would help to, um, you know, change the, the school counselor to teacher ratio. It would bring in school psychologists, you know, all of those pieces that could then help. Because right now, when we're missing those key people in the school, a lot of that is falling onto the teacher responsibility to address all those needs. And the teachers don't have, you know, the, it's hard to say, but they don't have the time in the day. They don't have the, the supports they need to really address those student, those student issues that are coming through their door. Another part of, uh, I guess you could say, uh, school safety. Uh, mental health is a big part of school safety Absolutely. right now for, for you know, according to everyone I've pretty much spoken with. Um, anything as far as school safety, because that's just something parents are, you know, really want to kind of know about. Anything that you would do as state superintendent to help make schools safer? You know, I think a lot of these questions have a lot of pieces to it. You know, I, I explain to people that so many of these issues are spider web issues where, you know, you pull one strand and several other strands move. When we're talking about school safety, you've got to talk about that mental health piece. You've got to talk about um, putting systems of support into place for students who are struggling academically. Um, you know, when you look at, at the school shootings that have occurred since forever, you know, it, they're, they're usually by students that feel isolated, that are not doing well in school, that are struggling in some sort of way, whether it be academically or socially or mentally. And so, you know, if we can help put, first of all, academic supports in place for students who are struggling learners, if we can increase that mental health piece, that social emotional piece to help students learn how to navigate their emotions to be able to identify their emotions and then navigate them in a positive manner, um, you know, that will help. And then, you know, other pieces of it is we, we've got to have um, a push for responsible gun ownership. You know, when you look at access to guns in South Carolina and the United States for that matter, it's way too easy for children and people to, to get guns. You know, there's incidences where you have elementary school students bringing guns to school, and that's on the responsibility of the adults in that household to make sure that their guns are locked up appropriately and that they've taught their students or their children gun safety. So there's that parent piece that is so important. You know, there's the policy piece where we're, where we're you know, maybe looking at what are appropriate gun restrictions um, to make sure that you don't necessarily have easy access to an assault rifle. Um, and then lastly, a lot of our school buildings are over 100 years old, and so they just in themselves are not safe because exterior doors are in locks are antiquated. Um, you may have broken windows that don't either open or close. So we've got to really look at, uh, you know, really fixing a lot of our school buildings that have aged and have not been kept up to date in terms of safety measures. If I'm watching this, and I'm an educator. Uh, what kind of message would you like to, to send to me uh, you know, as a teacher and maybe 
love my job, but may feel a little burnt out. Uh, what can we expect from you as state superintendent? Well, you know, when people ask me what the, the big issue in South Carolina is right now in terms of education, it's the, the teacher shortage. Um, so we, you know, we've got to really immediately start working to recruit and retain our teachers. And that, you know, is through working with the General Assembly in terms of increasing teacher salary, but then it's also addressing working conditions. And so, you know, that uh, oftentimes is a, even a, a district or a school level. But I think for me, that's the pressure that I want to put on, you know, the Department of Ed to make sure that we are pulling back any sort of um, over the top expectation of teachers that does not help student learning. And that, you know, we talk about the, the jumping through hoops or you've got to check a box, those sort of things where somebody, you know, as somebody says, well, it's, we've got to check this box. To me, that's not a reason to make a teacher do something. You know, if you can't tell me how it will benefit kids, then why are we making teachers do things? And that leads to the, the working conditions. You know, I tell people that we are not in a teacher shortage. We have plenty of certified teachers in South Carolina. They're just not willing to work under these conditions. And so if we can get our salary increase to where teachers aren't losing money each year because of inflation and get some of those teacher, those working conditions improved, then we'll start to have teachers coming back and saying, yeah, I'm willing to give it another try and see if this is any better. You know, I think we've also got to really address class sizes. Um, you know, there has been a waiver in the, gen in the budget every year about districts don't have to follow the, the law and class sizes. And you know, I've talked to teachers and they say, if you can guarantee that my first grade classroom is not gonna be over 18 or 20 students, I'll come back and teach that because it automatically lessens the amount of um, paperwork and you know, things that a teacher has to deal with. If you're trying to teach 18 first graders how to read, it's much easier to do than if you have a class of 27, 28, 30 first graders. You know, those are things that we've really got to make sure that we're taking care of our teachers because, of, you know, if you've got happy teachers, you have happy students and learning can take place. So as state superintendent, you'll be guiding this agency that, you know, has a lot of the money that state lawmakers you know, allocate every year in the state budget. How will you work with lawmakers to make these improvements to education, to, you know, like you say, fully fund education? I, you know, I think it's important that we have these conversations about, you know, what the policy level looks like from a legislator's point of view versus what it looks like in the classroom for a teacher. And I think that's what has gotten lost over the last five, ten years is that, that lawmakers have been told, oh, well, we need to do this. And, you know, they've heard from the business community, our, our students aren't prepared, or they've heard, you know, from somewhere else, oh, this is a problem. And in, instead of bringing teachers to the table and saying, here's what we're hearing, and having that conversation with each other to say, how can we solve this problem together, um, teachers have sort of been left out of the conversation. And so part of my running is to, to elevate that teacher voice and to say, okay, this is what you wanted in policy. Here's how it would look in my classroom. Let's find a, a middle ground to where we can both be happy with, with what we're doing. Um, I think, you know, I don't believe that any lawmaker really doesn't care about children in South Carolina. And so I think when you sit there and say, here's what children are dealing with right now, you know, and having those conversations, it makes it very personal. You know, I tell um, legislators that I have, when they put policy into place, I'm the one that has to look the students in the eye and, you know, address it there. And so I see day to day how the policy is impacting or how the underfunding is impacting students. And so just bringing that story up to the policy making level, I think can really open up some conversations and really have um, some good movement in, in what we need to do. You know, I'm hoping that, I'm also hoping that, you know, by me running for this office, it also gives courage to teachers um, and school bus drivers and cafeteria workers and instructional assistants to also have confidence in um, and courage in fighting for their own profession and their own students. 
um, and that maybe that will elevate their voice as well to try and bring that conversation because I can have a conversation as superintendent of education with a lawmaker, but it'd be much more impactful for the teachers in that lawmaker's area to call and say, you need to listen to what Lisa Ellis is saying because she's speaking the truth and that sort of thing. So I really hope that, that my winning this office um, in the election will galvanize teachers to be confident in their stories and to be willing to share their stories to lawmakers, but also to the community. You know, I think as I just often reflect on wh why we haven't gotten what we needed, honestly, I think that teachers have done an amazing job of putting band-aids over the problems. You know, when you look at a teacher's classroom and you think about all the money that has and time that has gone into decorating the teacher's classroom, that's not from any funding that the state has given it. That's from the teacher's own pocket. And we as teachers and we as schools have to stop covering up the cracks that are breaking because at some point we're not going to be able to cover it up anymore. And so I think if we start having honest conversations about how much better we could be doing if we had this policy in place or if we had this funding, then we get more people, particularly parents and grandparents on board with fighting for their, their children. And you brought up you know, parents, grandparents. There's been a, a renewed, I don't want to say renewed, but there's been an interest in what children are kind of learning in school, the specific subjects, how it's taught, things of that nature. How do you plan to address, you know, whether it's maybe concerns parents may have about you know, certain topics? I mean, people talk about uh, General Assembly would spend you know, months talking about critical race theory as well. Um, how do you kind of plan to address, you know, maybe any issues parents may have with something that may be taught in a school or things of that nature? I think the, the thing to remember is that teachers are teaching the South Carolina state standards. And so, you know, the state standards, every time that we revise them, there's opportunity for public in, in, um, input in them. You know, so everybody has an opportunity to look, review the state standards and give their input. I think what, what you are alluding to or, or bringing out is, um, what I like to say, uh, chasing ghosts. Um, you know, for, and that was the House spent months on talking about anywhere from critical race theory to banned books to, you know, all of these different things that I would argue aren't happening in our schools. And so, you know, I think that anytime somebody would say, oh, my kid is having to do this, I would want to sit, have that specific conversation with that parent and that child to say, tell me about this particular situation. Um, because that's what I think is, again, the chasing ghost piece is, you know, you hear it somewhere out on the news or on Facebook or social media and you're like, oh no, that can't be happening. And it's actually not happening, but we've created this sort of ghost to get away from what is actually happening in schools and that is underfunding. That is driving our teachers away, you know, that is threatening teachers and, you know, getting people to learn how to record teachers in action. You know, it's all of that movement to dismantle public education, you know, in order to privatize it. So I really, you know, when those issues come up and when parents have issues, I hope that they come forward with them, but I hope that they come forward with specific issues of this happened to my student and let's figure out a way to address those issues specifically. November is about uh, two months away. What message do you have to voters out there who maybe have not made up their mind on who they vote for? Um, I think that this race is really critical this year. Um, like I said earlier, you know, we are at a crossroads in terms of what we look, want public education to look like in South Carolina. Um, our public education system serves 800,000 students, and, and that's the students directly, but our public education system also serves our entire community. Um, you know, we are working to graduate students to take over jobs take over, you know, our roles. I keep saying that at some point I'm going to be old enough for a nursing home and I want the people who are taking care of me to be educated and, and, you know, ready and willing to jump into that situation. So, you know, even if you don't have children or grandchildren or nieces and nephews in school, you do have 
um, a, a stake in our educational system because we're always interacting with people who are either in public schools or graduates of public schools. And that is a, that's a pillar of our society, right? If we want an educated, critical thinking society, we have to take care of our public schools. And so that's the piece that I want people to understand is that we do have to choose the best person for this position, the person who has had um, the entire career in the public school setting, in a school setting, who has fought for public education for at least the last four years. I'm talking about me, if anybody's confused. Um, but really to have that fight. And then we also have to look at, you know, in terms of all of the statewide races, looking for candidates who are pro-public education. Um, and, and really because that ultimately makes the, the job easier for the teachers and the Department of Education, which ultimately makes our students um, have greater success in schools. Do you have any plans that we I'd ask you about or anything that you want to be sure to mention or say? Or just whether it's certain campaign things or anything like that that uh, you've kind of touched on before with maybe voters um, that I maybe didn't ask about? No, but I do want to go back. The question you asked about if I'm talking to teachers, one thing that I failed to mention that I think would help parents and students as well is the amount of testing that we're doing. Um, in public schools, it's way too much. You know, the fact that we are testing students as they enter kindergarten or first grade is insanity to me. Um, and that when we talk about learning loss, we have to talk about the days lost to testing. And so that's one of the things, you know, we have to follow federal law. We have the ability to change state law, but I think we've got to really start cracking down on the amount of testing, particularly at the district level that we're doing. Um, because it, it's negatively impacting our students in so many ways from, you know, the, again, the learning loss that I talked about, but also the mental health piece, the, you know, the emotion, the test anxiety that we're seeing. Um, those are some of the things that I think that we can also help um, directly benefit our students, but also benefit our teachers because they're not so, you know, stuck teaching to a test. Um, and I think the last thing that people need to understand is that I'm still in school working right now. So I, you know, I'm having to campaign on evenings and, and weekends and doing all of that. And so, you know, I'm still seeing the, the, the impact of policy and funding on our students every day. Um, I hope it's not. I hope that, that, you know, as I talk with people across the aisle, you know, really education should be nonpartisan. I mean, it should be where, you know, we understand that children are our future, children are our hope, and so we're going to do what's best for children regardless of what political party we're part of. And so, you know, that's, that's my answer to that. Um, but I think as long as I can have those conversations and bring it around to how it would positively impact students or negatively impact students, it's hard to, when you sit there and show specific examples, it's hard for somebody to say, oh, well, that doesn't matter. Because again, I've never, I have yet to meet somebody that's like, oh, no, I really don't care about our kids in South Carolina. Like, nobody says that. And so I think it's just trying to bring that, that personal story up to the policy level and have those conversations that I've been successful when I've been able to meet with legislators in small groups or one on one and having those conversations. And so I hope that, you know, the the door is always open on my side to to understand, but I hope that will be the same way, um, you know, across the aisle. My, my ultimate goal is to, to improve public education and give students access to a high quality education. And that's always when I, you know, talk about things or make decisions, it's always going to be what is in the best interest of our students.